Robbie, what's on your radar today? Well, Yuri Berliner, a longtime editor at National Public Radio, NPR, resigned from the media organization yesterday. Now, his saga began last week after he published an essay for Barry Weiss's The Free Press in which he criticized creeping liberal groupthink at his place of employment. Many NPR employees were furious that he would, quote, torch his workplace, though Berliner's piece carefully noted that he still believes the outlet is important and should continue to receive government funding. For writing about his own outlet without seeking permission from his bosses, Berliner was suspended for five days without pay, but ultimately he has chosen to resign. Quote, I cannot work in a newsroom where I am disparaged by a new CEO whose divisive views confirm the very problems at NPR that I cite in my free press essay, he said. Referencing statements made by NPR CEO Catherine Marr, whose considerable history of tweeting woke nonsense is now under public scrutiny as well. And he is quite correct. Berliner's article for Weiss concludes with this thought, or includes this thought. What's notable is the extent to which people at every level of NPR have comfortably coalesced around the progressive worldview. And this, I believe, is the most damaging development at NPR, the absence of viewpoint diversity. Berliner cited Russiagate, the Hunter Biden laptop story, and coverage of the lab leak theory of COVID-19's origins as coverage areas where NPR's bias in favor of the progressive establishment, Democratic Party perspective, led the outlet astray. A media company that did not completely dismiss non-progressive opinions out of hand might have fared better. The absence of viewpoint diversity at NPR should be no surprise, however, when its CEO apparently believes that ideological diversity is a dog whistle for anti-feminist, anti-POC stories. It's a direct quote from her Twitter feed. For Marr, diversity involves race, ethnicity, gender, class, ability, geography, everything, I guess, except diversity of thought. And Marr is not alone. Some 50 of Berliner's colleagues signed a letter to Marr demanding that she enforce NPR's current editorial line by weaponizing all available tools at her disposal. Quote from this letter, staff, many from marginalized backgrounds, have pushed for internal policy changes through mechanisms like the Accountability Committee, sharing of affinity group guidelines, and an ad hoc content review group, they wrote. Elsewhere in the letter, they put the term diversity of viewpoints in scare quotes. It certainly does not sound like the DEI Accountability Committee works to broaden NPR's ideological perspective. On the contrary, the employees who are obsessed with DEI seem to care first and foremost about rooting out anti-DEI heresy. Now, Berliner is not a victim of cancel culture. To be clear, most journalistic organizations would exercise some disciplinary authority over an employee who publicly discussed internal company policy without prior approval. But there should be little question that he accurately described a real problem at a regrettably taxpayer-funded media outlet. The acronym DEI ostensibly stands for diversity, equity, and inclusion, and the public is learning precisely what those terms really mean. What I'd like to know is what it really means to Catherine Marr. What does she really believe? Now, the embattled NPR CEO did have the opportunity on Wednesday, last night, to set the record straight regarding her views on intellectual diversity and white silence and whether Hillary Clinton, of all people, committed non-binary erasure when she used the phrase boys and girls. Yes, those were all things she tweeted about over the years. Unfortunately, during this recent appearance at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace to discuss the journalism industry's war on disinformation, she repeatedly declined to give straight answers, instead offering up little more than platitudes about workplace best practices. So I attended this event and I submitted questions that the organizers effectively ignored. That's a shame because Mars views certainly require clarity, especially now that Berliner has in fact resigned. As I mentioned earlier, his article implored his new boss, Mars tenure at, as CEO had actually only begun about a, a few weeks ago, to correct NPR's lack of viewpoint diversity. Does she support viewpoint diversity? Is it the woke caricature manifested by her earlier tweets? Is that the real her? Indeed, Mars' past tweets would be hard to distinguish from satire if one randomly stumbled across them. Her earnest, uncompromising wokeness and acknowledge, land acknowledgments, condemnation of Western holidays, and so on, sounds like they were written by parody accounts such as the Babylon Bee or Titania McGrath. In her 2022 TED Talk, she faulted Wikipedia, where she worked at the time, for being a Eurocentric written reference that fails to take into account the oral histories of other peoples. More seriously, she seems to view the First Amendment 
as an inconvenient barrier for tackling bad information and influence peddlers online. Watch this. The number one challenge here that we we see and is, of course, the First Amendment in the United States pro, is a fairly robust um, right, uh, protection of rights. And and that is a protection of rights both for platforms, which I actually think is very important that platforms have those rights to be able to regulate what kind of content they want on their sites. But it also means that it, it is a little bit tricky to really address some of the real challenges of where does bad information come from and sort of the influence peddlers who have made a real market economy around it. But interestingly, she did not reiterate any of those views during her appearance at the Carnegie Endowment on Wednesday. On the contrary, she gave entirely nonspecific answers about diversity in the newsroom. In fact, she barely said anything concrete about the subject of the discussion, disinformation. When asked by event organizer John Bateman, a Carnegie Senior Fellow, to address the Berliner controversy, she said she had never met him and was not responsible for the editorial policies of the newsroom. Quote, the newsroom is entirely independent, she said. My responsibility is to ensure that we have the resources to do this work. We have a mandate to serve all Americans. She repeated these lines over and over again. When asked more specifically about whether she thinks NPR is succeeding or failing, at making different viewpoints welcome, she pointed to the audience and said that her mission was to expand the outlet's reach. Are we growing our audience, she asked. That is so much more representative of how we are doing our job because I am not in the newsroom. At the event, Marr did not directly take audience questions and said audience members were asked to write out their questions and submit them via QR code. So I asked her whether she, should, whether she stood by her previous tweet that maligned the concept of ideological diversity, as well as the other tweets that had recently made the news. Frustratingly, she offered no further clarity on these subjects. Now, I'm just one taxpayer like you. Like everyone else, I contribute in some small way to her salary, and I would like to know what she actually thinks. Um, okay. Uh, a couple years ago, Nathan Robinson at Current Affairs wrote a piece about the lack of viewpoint diversity at uh, NPR that I really enjoyed that wasn't kind of wrapped up in one disgruntled employee's uh, vendetta against other sections of the other, um, what do you call them, uh, like uh, departments of the, uh, the company that he doesn't actually write in. Um, but in a desire for more anti-establishment news sources. And his critique of NPR was that it does have a very strong establishment bias, and I think that that's what you see in the Hunter laptop story in the Russiagate coverage. Um, I don't think it's partisan in nature, and I don't think that DEI is the problem. DEI is a problem only in so far as that it is a bad substitute for real viewpoint diversity, but I do think that given how difficult it is to sometimes um, achieve viewpoint diversity? How do you get a sense of what kind of views that are often very irrelevant to the job description you should be asking about? What constitutes diversity? Um, I do think I would put a pretty, I would, I, would put, I would place a bet on. I would say the odds are high that a racially, ethnically, gender diverse newsroom is going to have my, more diversity of ideas than a newsroom full of all white males, which is what we've historically had in this country. So the idea of kind of lashing out at uh, diversity on the workplace, the objective of diversity in the workplace, I find to be um, somewhat distasteful. I also just want to continue to note that Reagan already successfully manifestly um, def uh, defunded uh, NPR and that it's only funded by 11% taxpayer dollars. Um, the, to the to point about why the focus seems to be on DEI and why people don't seem to have the ability to critique some, an institution for being establishment without bringing race into it in ways that I think are missing the point. Um, a lot of the racial critiques are really solid. Um, the point you made about her saying uh, Wikipedia was is sufficiently uh, diverse is, is real and true. Studies have demonstrated that because most editors at Wikipedia are white and are male, that there are subject areas that are disproportionately edited and subject areas which are disproportionately under-edited, and they've been, there have been attempts to address this with edit-a-thons and things like that. I don't see why that would be something to be criticized. Shouldn't we want all information to be filled in as much as possible? I don't really understand what the critique is there unless you just think race 
is stupid and bad and funny or something. Or it, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not clear what the source of the mockery is. But overall, I agree that we have too much of an establishment bias in news sources. I did appreciate one of um, Berliner's colleagues at NPR writing a response. His name is Steve Instep on his uh, Substack. I don't agree with all of it. I do think that there are these issues at the at the company, but I do think he made an interesting point about how Berliner was commenting on people in sectors of NPR that he did not work in and did not know very much about the editorial process. And apart from, I think, really strong points about Russiagate, which again is this establishment bias, I think a lot of it does come across as personal grievance when you read some of the factual errors that he made in his, um, in his article. I saw factual errors alleged, but I wasn't actually sure what they meant by any of that. Or For example, not he, he argues that the uh, that everybody who works at NPR is a registered Democrat. And the guy who wrote this article is like, I'm in fact, you know, he at a meeting pulled out his uh, voter registration card or whatever, some documentation and said, I'm actually uh, a registered, I'm not registered as anything. Um, and when he put that question to Berliner and said, well, I'm the first person you're talking to about this, basically, and I'm already disproving your thesis. He's like, well, that doesn't matter. It's about the gestalt of things. He's like, well, how do you know what the gestalt of things is if you didn't actually ask anybody and don't really have any exposure or experience with other people who work outside of the economic, uh, economics desk at NPR? You're basically looking from 64,000 feet and making all of these claims about people that you've clearly not even decided it was worth talking to before you cast all these aspersions on the internet. And maybe he's right, but maybe he's not. And it seems pretty sloppy to me to be making a lot of fanfare about a lot of things that you have done very little um, to vet in the first place. And isn't vetting things and following the facts and following the evidence exactly the kind of journalism that Berliner is purporting to care about when he critiques wokeness or DEI or these other incentives that he thinks are poisoning journalism at NPR? I think, as I said in my radar, that talking about the internal discussions at your workplace is always going to get publicly is always going to get you uh, get you in trouble so I don't I'm not describing him as like a cancel culture victim I don't think it was necessarily wrong to take some kind of action um, against him at all um, but what I'm most interested in Catherine Mars apparent about face on this this subject um, and I so I attended this event with her yesterday and I was genuinely curious to hear her address some of these um, some of these questions, and I frankly think I think you would have been just as frustrated as I was to hear her describe in terms so abstract and so um, frankly almost corporate, sort of empty um, what she see. I, in fact, I was waiting to hear her say things about disinformation that I knew I was not going to like about how you know we need to moderate more content on social media or we need more involvement with the federal government. You know all the things I kind of don't <laughs> that I approaches that I think are bad. And it was so, what she had to say was so free of substance whatsoever. Maybe she's just been scared away from saying anything that like it's remotely provocative. But I didn't, I, I couldn't get any sense of whether she was doubling down on the things she said about viewpoint diversity and or the importance of other kinds of diversity, but not that. I, I couldn't tell whatsoever. And I asked, and I didn't get an answer. And that was frustrating. You know, another point in this Inskeep piece is that uh, Berliner made a big deal about the use of the word Latina. It's you know, I think it's as silly as the next person, but uh, some conservatives have made their entire identity around hating the word Latinx, and no, no working class person is hurting and suffering because the word Latinx exists in the world. No, but and in Latino fact, he was wrong about it. So he, he did an analysis of how often NPR uses the term over the previous 90 days. He found 179, uh, sorry, 197 uses of Latino, 201 uses of Latina, and just nine uses of the Latinx, usually used by a guest on NPR who certainly they can't censor out of using a word that they choose to use. Um, so again, are we just cherry picking things that you think are a problem because you read about them on the internet and making broad sweeping claims that are not generalizable about what's going on at NPR while at the same time ignoring the big issue, which I would argue is that the consequence of defunding, uh, uncoupling NPR from public defunding and instead making them rely on an, an, an affluent listener base who wants to hear certain kinds of stories and more importantly, corporations, banks, um, you know, financial institutions, people whose interests are not aligned with the public interest, is forcing the hand of its coverage in a direction that is more establishment, not less. 
I mean, the, the direction of the coverage being toward a kind of establishment democratic progressivism seems to be taking place. I, I don't think it necessarily has to do with the funding model. It seems to be taking place at liberal media institutions regardless of the funding model. And that's why people think that it's what What liberal institution is not, is not uh, funded by corporations and advertisers? Well, I... Uh, the Washington Post has a right has a wealthy. It's funded by a billionaire. Right, right. I'm saying regardless uh, of the funding model, NPR. But the, it's not regardless of the funding model. This is a problem across all liberal media because all liberal media has the same funding model. By the way, so does all the overwhelming majority of conservative media. The difference is that you do have more independent conservative uh, media that's well funded because the interests of the billionaires that still continue to fund independent conservative media align with the messaging that they have on their shows. Don't tax millionaires. Defund the IRS so they don't go after the wealthy. I, I agree with the problems about uh, the IRS disproportionately going after the poor. But defunding them entirely so that they can't get rich people's money that they're hiding over overseas is also a problem. So that's why you that's that's the state well, look, of media right I support right now. alternative me, uh, uh, methods of funding media or alternative platforms or uh, donor based or subscription based or user supported or reader supported I think those are all good models for the future and um, I'm glad to see so many uh, frankly so many of those thriving and uh, and the, the media ecosystem becoming a more uh, a more diverse place diversity is good if it's across well, that's, the board. that's not what we're happening see, seeing sure happen we're seeing local media companies shut down we're seeing independent left media like the uh, the Intercept flail once the billionaire donor withdraws, and we see that the only people I think if if you are someone that can very very easily be funded by a Koch brother, you're going to say, okay, it's great. Let's just let the chips fall where they may, because you know you're always going to be able to get funding as long as your views happen to align with what the Koch brothers want. But if you're someone who's genuinely anti-establishment, who genuinely wants there to be a protection of poor and working class voters, support for unions, support for low wages, support for health care as a human right, you're never going to get funding from the people whose entire billionaire status depends on keeping those benefits from you. Keeping, not benefits, keeping those things which you've worked for with the most productive labor force in American history that is being stripped from you and given to the very top 1%, you're never going to get that redistribution actually coming back to your pocket as long as the people who are paying for your news want to keep that reality from you. Well, we are, we, my side of things, does not want to uh, create an environment where people who are unwilling to fund journal, uh, don't want to contribute to journalism that's looking into those things are forced to do that, which is a, the NPR model or the left progressive model. We're saying things and we think we have the right to be paid to say them regardless of what, we're, what we think. I, that's not the way we feel. Right. Well, again, this guy, uh, Steve in Inskeep, I do think he yada, yada, yada is over the substantive point about the establishment bias of NPR, which I think is a good point. But he, I think he does also poke some pretty significant holes in oh, Berliner's should... argument, so people can feel free to check that out Where as well. Where was that? Uh, it was on his uh, Substack, which is called We uh, Differ, We Must. Take a look. Decide for yourselves. More rising right after this.